Good morning and welcome to the Centre for Policy Studies webinar. My name is Eamon Ives, I'm the Head of Energy Environment here at the CPS uh, and I'll be your chair for the next hour. Um, today's session is the fourth in our Getting to Net Zero series, which we are running in partnership with Aviva. Um, and our topic for today is uh, the decarbonisation of Britain's building stock. Um, for a bit of context, buildings um, account for a really significant um, portion of emissions in the UK and decarbonising them will be one of the um, trickiest parts of the whole material equation, I think most people agree. Um, the government has also recently released its strategy to um, reduce emissions from buildings, the heat and building strategy. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear what our panellists, um, our panellists' thoughts um, on that strategy are uh, and, and the things that it detailed in it. Um, before introducing them, uh, however, I'd just like to do a quick bit of housekeeping as usual. Um, so the format of this event, we'll hear some introductory remarks from each of our speakers. Um, we'll then move on to a short discussion um, among ourselves, and then we're going to open it up um, to questions from the audience. Um, you can get those questions in whenever you like, maybe when our speakers are giving their remarks, um, you can do that using the question and answer function. Um, so do please get them in as and when you want. Um, you can also do that over social media using our Twitter handle at CPS Think Tank. Um, but with all that out of the way, um, I'm thrilled to introduce um, each of our panellists. First up, we have the Right Honourable Lord Deven. Lord Deven is the current chair of the Climate Change Committee, uh, a position he's held since 2012. He was formerly an Environment Secretary in John Major's government and a minister uh, under Margaret Thatcher. So I think he's well placed um, to run through his thoughts um, on the issue of how to decarbonise our building stock. So Lord Deven, if you'd like to take us away with your remarks. Well, thank you very much. Yes, well, it's quite difficult to talk in four minutes about uh, one of the biggest problems that we, we have got, uh, which is very simply that um, we can't reach net zero unless we face up to the issue that how we heat our homes, how we build our buildings, because that is now, after generation, the biggest issue. And so when people say, well, it's all going to be very difficult, I'm afraid you have to start off with the point is it may be very difficult, but it has to be done. There's no there's no way out of that. So what can we do about it? And, and we do have uh, uh, ways of dealing with it. First of all, we have to build in the future in a way which uses much less resource, both in the building and, of course, you then have an office or a, a, um, a home which uses very, very much less energy. And we know how to do that. Unfortunately, um, the government in 2017 made a terrible mistake, which was not to go to zero carbon homes, which they had promised. And therefore, we've built a million homes that have got to be retrofitted in the meantime. And <clears throat> what that means in, in financial terms is that the house building passes the cost of going to net zero, so to speak, to the house owner, instead of building the house in the first place in a way which means it doesn't have to be retrofitted. And I do actually think that the house building industry has been appalling in this. It has actually, it's, it, it's perfectly possible to do this when you build a home. You, doesn't cost very much more and most of that cost you can get if all of it you can get out of uh, lowering the price of land because of course the land price is very elastic the big gap between agricultural price and and uh, development price so that's where we are and we have to improve that the government's now going to enforce many much tougher regulations unfortunately um, it's not going to do so until 2025 so there'll be even more houses built which have to be retrofitted I think this is a great mistake and if the industry had any gumption it would actually deal with it itself and not wait for that moment but I'm afraid it doesn't um, and then as far as retrofitting is concerned well the way forward is in fact um, the increased use <coughs> of um, uh, air source or ground source heat pumps which enables you actually to reduce your energy consumption very very considerably and makes it possible to use of course electricity and therefore you're being able to use what will be by 2035 entirely um, uh, carbon free electricity which is what uh, the prime minister has now promised and committed ourselves to so uh, we have a way forward but the difficulty is that the cost of this 
um, is at the moment uh, significant. I've, I've got one, um, I have to say, because I try to walk the walk, but I have to tell you, not only is the cost that, but it's extremely difficult to get the information. And even as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, I found it difficult to get information. You, you can, if you've got the money, you can buy an electric car very easily because there are a lot of people out there who want to sell you a car. So they know about selling. The, the heat pump industry doesn't know about selling at all. So they can't tell you what you want to know. So one of the things we have to do is to make sure that people can get the information and they can take the, the opportunities up. The government has started that off. It's wrong to complain that it's only going to do 90,000 uh, heat pumps a year and, and that actually we need to have 10 times that. The truth is that the government's plan is that if you begin to get the market moving, then you can begin to get the industry working and then you can begin to do what we have to do. And then you can think seriously about how you help those who are poorest to make that change when they have to. So I'm, I'm not against what the government is doing. We've just got to keep its feet to the fire to make sure that, that is actually what it's doing and that it isn't just an excuse for not, for not doing the whole thing. So that's where we are. And uh, I think I've more than finished my few moments. Well, thank you, Lord Devon. I'm sure um, you and your committee will be doing exactly that in the years to come on the keeping the feet to the fire. Um, I'll now turn to our second speaker today, who is Edward Dixon. Uh, Edward is the head of ESG for Aviva Investors, um, £52 billion pound real estate platform, which covers real estate and, uh, and infrastructure, which are obviously two uh, critically important issues for us today. Um, so Edward, if you'd like to give us your opening remarks. Thank you, and really uh, pleased to be invited to speak uh, with you today. It's absolutely unequivocal. Our industry is a major contributor to the climate crisis and the emissions from buildings plus the power and the transportation that we invest in on a day-to-day -day basis here at Aviva Investors are absolutely responsible in their industries for 60% you know, of UK emissions. So um, buildings and infrastructure are a really significant part of the problem. And although closer to home in the UK, a lot of the buildings that we'll be living in and working in in 2050 have already been built, Actually, as the world's population uh, approaches 10 billion, the global building stock is expected to double. So that's the equivalent of adding a New York City every single month. So the crisis, uh, the crisis closer to home is absolutely a, a, a challenge of addressing what we have uh, further afield. It's much more so about how we look to the future and, and planning uh, uh, how we build new. Now, we are undoubtedly in a very serious situation and the climate crisis presents catastrophic risks both for our clients and for society. And in many cases, they're the same people uh, in Aviva Investors. We invest typically long-term pension money. So many of the people that will be listening today on the call, you'll have car insurance or health insurance, life insurance, or you might have a pension, your staff pension scheme that will be probably invested by us in something that you'll use every day, real estate or, in, or infrastructure. So we're, we're all affected by this and, and we're all, we're all, we're all, uh, we're all in, in it together. I think with that huge forecasted growth um, comes a huge unprecedented investment opportunities. And I think that's our position on this matter is that a lot of the communication that we tend to hear about this topic is around cost. How, how do we find the money? How do, how do we actually cover the costs of getting to net zero? But actually the transition to a low carbon economy over the next 20 to 30 years is the investment opportunity of a lifetime. And we're gearing up to be able to capitalize on that opportunity on behalf of our clients. And our clients consequently represent, as I said, many of the people that would be listening today on this call, members of the public, uh, which really hope that their pensions will be there uh, when they retire. Now, just in terms of the detail on, on that, we've committed, like many other companies, to reach net zero by 2040 across our real assets platform. Uh, and that means different things in different parts of the platform. So we're obviously aggressively decarbonizing our real estate investments, um, but we're also investing into new technologies to try to stimulate the, the change and get to where we need to get to. Now, 
net zero goals are absolutely meaningless uh, if they're not backed up by very robust short-term targets. Uh, and this pins back to the point about the investment opportunity and the way that we're really thinking about this challenge. So for example, we've committed to investing two and a half billion in low carbon and, and renewable energy infrastructure and buildings between now and 2025. We We've committed to increasing our renewable energy generation capacity to one and a half gigawatts. We've committed to originating a billion of climate transition focused uh, loans in, in the real estate sector. Um, we've committed to launching half of our all of our new product launches with a sustainable or an impact label. And we've committed to decarbonize, decarbonizing our real estate by 30% uh, by 2025. Now, all of those five short term goals really come back to one thing, and that's opportunity. So we really strongly propose that uh, one of the really important ingredients for rethinking this challenge is for us all to start to get really excited about the investment opportunity, as well as um, worrying about the costs that will be inevitably needed to get us there. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Again, uh, a lot to pick up uh, in our discussion afterwards there. Um, before introducing our third speaker, I'll just take another moment to remind our audience that if you'd like to react to anything you've heard so far or are about to hear um, with a question, do please um, get them in um, as, as and when you want to. Um, but yes, on to our next guest. Uh, please let me introduce uh, Lucy Yu. Lucy is the Chief Executive of the Centre for Net Zero. Uh, the Centre for Net Zero is a research lab which uses data-driven modelling to provide insights um, on a range of different areas, um, from decarbonising homes, which is obviously important for us, um, but also things like transport. Um, so without wanting to eat into any more of her time, I'll, I'll hand over to Lucy now. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Eamon. Um, so a few thoughts from me. I think maybe first of all, just starting by quantifying the scale of the challenge of decarbonizing our, our buildings. Um, I have spent about 20 years working in tech and tech policy. And um, one of the things that I hear uh, on quite a regular basis is uh, it really relates to the, the, the pace of acceleration of data and digital. And I, I often hear it said that about 90% of all of the world's data has been created in, in the past two years. And, and no doubt that will actually, that time period will get compressed more and more uh, as that pace of acceleration increases. But I, I think this is really interesting because actually when it comes to decarbonizing buildings, we almost have the opposite challenge here in that um, the vast majority of, of the buildings that we will have in 2050, or dare I say, even in 2060, have probably already been built. Um, so we actually have the challenge of decarbonizing um, an awful lot of building stock, which is already here. Um, this really brings me on to my next point, and uh, Lord Deben talked talked to, talked at length about retrofitting. But um, of course, you wouldn't keep filling a leaky bucket without first trying to fix the leak. Um, and I think um, it's very important to kind of recognise the role of energy efficiency here. So as well as the adoption of, of low carbon technologies, we talked about heat pumps, no doubt there will be some more conversation about that, um, but also really recognizing the, the role of this um, uh, energy efficiency of buildings um, and also uh, really getting into the detail here, um, understanding where there might be split incentives. So um, there may be uh, the person who needs to make the investment to make a building efficient, may not be the person um, seeing the savings from that and similarly the payback period for some of these measures um, might be very long so really thinking very smartly about how we can overcome some of those structural uh, challenges. Um, a couple of points on how we can use planning uh, to, to help uh, with the net zero agenda. Um, I think one of the things, uh, one of the shifts we can make is really to think about um, how we can take new developments to the grid rather than necessarily having to build out the grid to new developments. Um, so if you think about transport, it's uh, if you're going to put a new development somewhere, it's um, you avoid the cost of having to build new roads, new transport infrastructure if you put that development where that already exists. Um, and we should be thinking about energy infrastructure in the same way. Avoided costs here are very important. So where there is already existing infrastructure, uh, we should be doing what we can to try to enable developments 
um, to be made in those places. I also think we can do more to think about uh, new developments, um, not just in isolation, um, so not just looking at uh, their own sustainability as, as an isolated development, but also thinking about their contribution to the system overall. Um, and that could be a contribution in terms of infrastructure or a contribution in terms of flexibility. Um, so I live um, very close to, to the world's most sustainable branch of IKEA, it's the Greenwich branch. Um, now that branch of IKEA is fitted with solar panels on the roof, for instance, but it's also heated and cooled by a geothermal system. So that's the type of infrastructure that could potentially be shared uh, with neighbouring buildings, neighbouring properties. Um, but also in terms of flexibility, some types of development, some types of businesses, some types of use of land may be more flexible in terms of uh, their kind of uh, demand for, for electricity and um, the ability to shape that demand than others. So again, we should be really thinking about how that flexibility can support other neighboring buildings, which might be more or less flexible and how that can contribute to balancing the grid locally. Um, I think just a final comment. I don't know if anyone on the call is interested in architecture. Um, yesterday, I spotted uh, a news story about uh, the death of um, a British architect called Owen Luder. Um, and he was actually um, named as the kind of the, the architect of some of, Britain, some of Britain's most hated buildings. Now, the reason for this is that these were... Uh, uh, concrete buildings. Um, so he was uh, he was active during a, an architecture period known as brutalism. So um, buildings made out of concrete. Um, that's the brutalist uh, kind of architecture style. Um, and I think one of the one of the benefits we can get from uh, moving towards net zero buildings is that it will um, cause us to think about more sustainable building materials, other materials um, which are perhaps a little bit more attractive in appearance and might actually contribute to um, a, a more beautiful urban realm um, and actually improve people's uh, well-being, really creating places and spaces that people want to be. Wonderful, thank you Lucy, that was great and now um, as we're so early in, in, in on the day I'm able to keep my opinions on brutalism to myself. Um, but I'll now bring in our, my final speaker um, of this morning, um, Emma Harvey. Emma works for the Green Finance Institute, where she is their programme director. Uh, the GFI leads um, sort of sectoral coalitions of experts and identify and, and unlock barriers to investment in environmental solutions. So Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. And it's been fascinating hearing what the other speakers have, have talked about. We've had uh, the technical challenges to retrofitting, the need for investment, the need for data and new ways of thinking around architecture. And it just shows that, that retrofitting the built environment is an incredibly complex challenge with lots of different sectors involved. And I think one of the biggest statistics that always sticks in my head is the, the investment gap that was reported in the CCC's sixth carbon budget. So £360 billion of investment is needed to 2050, £250 billion of which is needed to decarbonise our homes. And clearly this will need funding beyond just what the public purse can deliver. And one of the areas that's quite often overlooked in this challenge is, is the really significant role of private finance, and in particular consumer finance, in helping to bridge that investment gap. And also how the retrofit revolution can actually help to make the UK financial sector a leader in green finance, which we know is one of the key objectives from the UK's green finance strategy. The UK's financing market already actually has some emerging models to help homeowners fund decarbonisation projects. So we've seen the green mortgage market in the UK really take off over the last few years. There's been products around since 2006 when Ecology Building Society launched their first product. But since about 2018, when Barclays and Lloyds and NatWest and high street banks to small building societies started to launch green mortgage products, we've really started to see that market take off. And we're seeing now the government get involved in helping to accelerate and stimulate that market further. Um, so I'd, I'd really recommend if you want to learn a little bit more about green mortgages, there's lots of thought leadership out on the uh, Internet and on the GFI's website. 
But green mortgages won't plug the gap alone. We do need the type of investment that Ed was talking about, but we also need other types of consumer products that genuinely do address the challenges that homeowners face. These can be things such as property-linked finance, also known as PACE finance in the United States, which links repayment obligations to a property. So if somebody took out some financing to retrofit their home, they will only be repaying for that work measure while they're living in the property. If they subsequently move and the new homeowner who comes in and benefits from a lovely warm home, they would be making the repayments. It helps to address that payback barrier, which is a huge issue for retrofitting. We've also think, seen things like local climate bonds be innovated lately, which allows local authorities to raise capital to invest into decarbonisation projects in their areas and in social housing. And what's exciting about local climate bonds is that local citizens can invest from as little as £5 into these bonds and then see positive activities happening in their local area and know that they have delivered a genuine tangible benefit. But if we want to start creating this smorgasbord of interesting and useful financial solutions, there are several factors that are going to be critical to success. The first is a clear and ambitious policy uh, trajectory, because this will create demand from homeowners and consumers for low carbon technologies, and that will give financial institutions the confidence to innovate and mainstream their green financing products. We also need R&D support for um, financial innovation. It can be expensive to innovate new products. So we really welcome the government's announcement of the new Green Home Finance Accelerator, which was announced just last week. And we look forward to seeing further innovation schemes coming to market. We also need the enabling environment. So we need policies, regulations and senior leadership to ensure that financial professionals feel empowered to be able to innovate into this space. And last but not least, we need cross-sectoral collaboration. Coming right back to my point at the very start, we this is a complex challenge. Lots of sectors are involved. So initiatives such as the Coalition for the Energy Efficiency of Buildings and many others that are out there that are helping to bring together different sectors to innovate solutions for this space is going to be absolutely vital. So finance is not a silver bullet, um, but it is the ultimate enabler for helping us get to net zero. So let's make sure the innovation is in place and it doesn't become a block of the net zero. So pass back to you, Eamon. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Emma. Um, so we've now kind of heard from all of our speakers uh, this morning. So I'd like to open it up into a little bit of a discussion um, amongst ourselves, uh, and then we'll bring in some questions from the audience. We see we're already getting quite a few um, racking up uh, in my um, box down there. Um, so, and, and please don't hesitate to sort of make any more um, should you have any. Um, Lord Deben, you've been waiting patiently having given the first remark, so maybe I'll, it's only fair that I sort of come back and start with you. Um, I think kind of broadly, um, and I'd maybe allow other speakers to jump in on this question, but we obviously had the heat and building strategy recently. Um, I saw this morning um, Chris Stark from the CCC um, doing nice thread on, on um, CCC's analysis of it, and, and I think reasonably positive, and, and particularly on buildings, it seems like the government's ambition is at least in line, if not um, going further than sort of what the CCC recommended. Um, can you provide any sort of um, extra thoughts and, and flesh out what, what Chris maybe mentioned this morning? Well, the, the fact is that this is the next step, if you like. We, we had uh, the parliament passing the sixth carbon budget, these are the things which um, the um, uh, which the um, uh, climate change committee have put forward, and the government has, in large measure, taken those on. As you say, meet a bit further in some, and and uh, uh, rather less on others. So all that has been, um, uh, we think, rather a good step. Um, indeed, a very good step. But it is just the next step. I mean, what then has to happen is that that has to put, put in reality. Um, in, and, and there's no way around that. I mean, we just, uh, we just have to um, see that as um, a, a, something which I have to look at, the committee has to look at all the time, seeing that the government keeps, we keep its feet to the fire to do the things that it says it's going to do. And I think it wants to. And of course, it needs huge support from the rest of us because this is not easy. And the government, it's quite difficult for governments to have long term aims and then do these things as they have to be month by month, literally. 
Um, and so th there's got to be a much more positive view about the government's efforts here. Um, but at the same time, we've got to be pretty tough about it, it delivering. And it's that balance. And in the end, of course, you build a much better world. I mean, fighting climate change is absolutely essential. But at the end of that, you have a greener and cleaner and kinder world because of what you've done. So there is a real positiveness behind the whole thing. Mm, thank you. And I think maybe just pivoting quickly to Edward, you know, we, we talk about there's going to be a range of different actors and, and maybe could you give us kind of the, the investor perspective, obviously kind of dwelled on this a little bit, um, but your kind of thoughts on, on the strategy and, and maybe the general approach that the government seems to be mapping out. Thanks, Eamon. Yeah, certainly. Um, I guess if we uh, take a, a, a step back and, and think about the impact of the heat and building strategy on, on our sector, so in terms of what it means for finance and what it means for institutional investment in the built environment, um, whilst the strategy does serve the domestic uh, corner of the market very well, and obviously we're very pleased to see that um, so many strong commitments have been made across the board, I think this, you know, it's addressed broad market factors, but could do more on commercial. Um, and that could potentially stimulate the market and lead to some longer term changes. So if we think about our little corner of the market in non-domestic properties, um, most large commercially rented properties are managed by larger institutional uh, landlords, prop you know, property companies. And a lot of that is underpinned um, by uh, pension money, right? So it, it's relevant to, to all of us. And the retrofit of those larger, perhaps more complex properties is a really significant part of the problem. And that's perhaps the area where, although we've seen some longer term commitments from the heat and building strategy, um, it could be argued that perhaps the shorter term, firmer policy responses aren't perhaps where they need to be. So, for example, um, you know, we've seen a uh, long term strategy for energy and use performance becoming mandatory for commercial buildings. Um, that's something that will really help to um, encourage commercial building owners to really understand how their buildings are performing. And consequently, if we can understand how they're performing, then that will encourage a quicker retrofit when we realize the scale of the problem. So I think we'd like to see stronger action sooner on that point. Um, but although, you know, obviously it's been out for consultation recently, so we're certainly on the right track. I think in terms of energy performance certificates, the little label that tells us all how efficient our buildings are, really important. Um, they don't tell you everything, but they're certainly a really important indicator of how sustainable a building is. Um, we've seen, again, a long-term plan for the min man uh, minimum EPC uh, certificate standard to go up by 2030. Again, I think we need to see that enshrined in policy uh, and we need to see some really firm action on that right now. Um, and finally, um, although we've obviously seen the longer term plans for 2035 for moving away from gas boilers in terms of new installations in homes, again, I think we need to see firmer uh, responses in commercial property. Um, to start to move away from gas as rapidly in the commercial and non-domestic sector as we do in homes. I think what's also interesting as well is the intersection between the heat and building strategy and the UK taxonomy and the sustainability disclosure requirements. Um, people on the call might know, but over the last year or so, we've seen this huge influx of um, EU uh, policy that affects lots of asset managers that are operating or uh, in, in, in Europe. And that is starting to really drive investment into cleaner, greener buildings. Now, part of the problem with that is that it doesn't necessarily reward transition, i.e. Uh, buildings which are being actively decarbonized aren't necessarily recognized as being a sustainable investment. So I think one thing that is really important is that when government are starting to think about really locking in the new UK taxonomy and the sustainability disclosure requirements, how do we ensure that the end investor, which might be me or you or anyone else listening on this call, can be rewarded for investing sustainably in actively decarbonizing buildings as well as just investing in buildings that are green. But the final point I'd say is that, you know, although there might be a little bit of a gap on non-domestic property in terms of the actions right now, we're obviously really, really pleased to see that there's firm action across the board in terms of stimulating the market. And that comes back to our, on our position on this is that it creates a huge unrivaled market opportunity. Mm, thanks, Fad. Um, 
No, it's sort of maybe parking heat in buildings, at least for a little while. Um, I'd like to turn to something that Lucy picked up on, which was kind of the, the broad point around that planning policy. Um, I think one thing that, that often gets missed out in this debate is, um, you know, the sort of the idea that moving towards maybe denser communities and, and not necessarily um, monstrously dense, but uh, certainly denser than we, we generally have in the UK could actually pay quite a lot of climate dividends. Um, and especially in terms of whether it allows retrofitting of buildings or maybe more sustainable transport networks and things like that. Lucy, I don't know if you want to kind of elaborate a little bit on, on some of the points you were kind of um, groping towards when you were making your opening remarks. Yeah, um, I, I'd be interested to hear from the other panellists on this as well. But um, I, I mean, I think this, I, I have a lot of conversations with people in my network about this sort of concept of the 15 minute city, which is a sort of urban planning and transport uh, concept really um, and, and this is the idea that uh, uh, everybody should be able to kind of uh, walk or cycle or use some form of active travel to get to um, all the things they might they might need in their day-to-day -day lives so it could be their work their education their recreation and, and so on and so forth um, and uh, I, I think we you know there is a gap here for a very similar kind of thinking about future energy infrastructure we know that to have a higher penetration of renewables on the grid in future actually um, having increased flexibility is going to become more important so um, you know we could think about that flexibility at a very kind of macro sort of level but actually um, to my mind, it makes much more sense to think about that first um, in much sort of smaller local uh, community type uh, units, if you like. So um, I'll perhaps leave it at, at there for now. And I'm sure some of the others uh, have some, some, some thoughts on this as well. Mm, definitely. I, mean, I think one, one thing which, and Emma, I'll, I'll certainly bring you in, uh, um, you know, policy interventions like street boats. I don't know whether the CCC has heard of those, Lord Deben, but, um, but I think really interesting policy proposal um, to allow um, sort of the densification on a sort of street by street level that, um, that I think could, could genuinely help in the whole retrofitting um, equation. Emma, I, I saw you hoping to come in. So do you want to? Yeah, just to kind of build on Lucy's point around the, the importance of place-based decarbonisation, um, not only to tap into economies of scale that you can build in a local area, but also to leverage the local knowledge, the local supply chains, because we hear throughout, you know, a lot of what the, the government advocates for in the Green Revolution is the fact it will create a wealth of green jobs, and those need to be happen on a local level as well but also just understanding the nuances of individual areas, which would be very different from a rural community to, you know, inner city London. Um, on the financing, how financing can play into place-based uh, solutions, I've mentioned already around local climate bonds, but one scheme that we've seen be quite successful uh, that's been trialled in, in Greater London and in Cambridgeshire and a couple of other places is aggregating demand for particular home technologies. So some of you may have heard of the Solar Together programme that was run in Greater um, London. This mean this allows people living in a particular geographic area to register their interest for solar panels to be put on their roof. And then the scheme provider will go out and bulk purchase these solar panels at cheaper costs because they are giving certainty of demand and then installed to a high quality. What we are doing at the Institute is then taking that one step further and integrating the financial decisions into the customer's journey. So working with financial institutions, and with data and technology platforms to actually offer this proposition to customers so they have a really seamless end-to-end -end journey. So I think, again, I think the finance sector can get very involved in these place-based um, pushes. And the last little piece I'll just say is, again, I talked around green mortgages. Let's not forget uh, the influence that local and regional building societies can have in their area and how close they can actually be to their customers. So that, again, great opportunity for them to actually just raise awareness with their customers around the importance of greening, greening their homes, greening their transport, greening their community. Mm, certainly. Thanks for that, Emma. Uh, Lord Even, you, you raised your hand. Well, I was just going to say that uh, I think that the planning uh, uh, steps are really hugely important. We need a new planning act we're going to have one, but it's got to be one which really is tied in to how do we deliver net zero. And at the moment, our planning system doesn't begin to talk about it. Secondly, of course, we ought to be building on brownfield sites in cities. 
The, the, uh, this is doubly important. Uh, not only do I agree with Emma and, and Lucy about that, but I want to say the other thing is we don't want to be building on, on greenfield sites because we need those greenfields for the soil to sequestrate carbon. We need those fields for us to grow food. I mean, it's a really important thing. And what is happening all over the country is people are building crap homes on the edges of villages. And this is unacceptable because, I mean, the, our local village where I live, the fact is that 97% of the people are commuting and they're commuting by car because there's no other way of commuting from the village to the nearest town. We shouldn't be building there. We should be building in the towns to provide people's homes and that is what civilization was about after all cities and civilization are very close together the two happen we are there are two decent ways to live one is out in the country and the other is to live hugger mugger where you really do learn about things and know about things and decent houses can be very very uh, tightly built look the one of the very most dense buildings that there is, is the Royal uh, Circus in Bath, thought to be the most beautiful homes, places that people really want to live in. It doesn't need to be bad. It can be really good if you design it properly. And that's what we need is better design, design in our cities and a planning act, which makes it much more difficult to build on green fields. And just on that, do you think, therefore, you know, if you're saying that you want to protect the greenfields, um, presumably, you know, these houses do need to go somewhere and, and certainly some can go on brownfield land. But do you think we also need to have a bit more of a frank discussion about actually kind of demolishing existing stock and, and sort of rebuilding at higher densities? Well, I think demolition is always a dangerous thing because you do it, it's very expensive as far as carbon is concerned. So you've got to be very careful about demolition. But there is no doubt that we could renovate, and I prefer to use that word, very much more effectively, which I think was the point that Lucy was making, that you really can make a very big difference. And what you do is to do the, um, if at the same time you make places better to live in, better insulated, lower um, energy use, if at the same time as doing that, you extend them, you build around them, you create new homes. If you do those at the same time, you can do that in a very cost-effective way. And that's what we ought to, we've got to be more imaginative. I mean, the house building business is the least imaginative business in the Britain. You build this, they're practically building the same houses as they built a hundred years ago. I mean, it really isn't very different. And they're building them with, with mechanisms which they certainly have used the last 50 years. And their excuse always is, well, people like these houses. Well, people don't have a chance to have any other house because that's what they're building. And why? Because they make the best return on capital that they've ever made. And it's time we actually said this is an industry which has got to change absolutely fundamentally if we are going to meet our targets. Thank you. Um, we've, I think we've kind of abused our privilege as speakers. Um, we've probably gone on a little bit too long. So I, I'd like to, like to go into the, the questions from the audience. Um, and, and starting off with um, with one kind of around about, um, I think, possibly building on what Emma said. Um, you know, Emma, you talked about the, the importance of R&D um, in this whole equation. Um, and obviously, kind of spending R&D is, is certainly one half of the, the, the question. Um, are, there, are there any other areas, maybe in terms of the regulatory barriers? You know, we've spoken about EPCs. We've, we've heard that they may be good, but not perfect. Um, do you think, Emma, there's any sort of things, and not necessarily deregulating, but perhaps better regulating, um, and then possibly, Lucy, if you could um, chip in on this, I'm not sure, um, but maybe about how we can sort of use data and things like that to actually deliver, um, you know, a healthier um, and, and greener um, building stock. Mm. So uh, speaking in particular on, on the financing side, because obviously there's, there's 
actions happening on EPCs through the EPC action plan. And we know that the government committed to consult on introducing minimum energy efficiency standards for owner occupied homes, as well as private rented homes, which would provide a very strong stimulus for, for homeowners to have to improve their property. Two things I do want to mention. One is um, we, we've been working with um, the UK GVC, who published a report earlier on in the year about introducing an energy adjusted stamp duty land tax, which would mean that when people purchase a property, they would pay slightly less stamp duty if they bought an energy efficient home, slightly more if they bought a less energy efficient home. But if they retrofitted that property within, let's say, 24 months of the purchase, they could get a tax rebate. So it would be um, it would be cost neutral to Treasury, but would provide a nudge factor to homeowners to retrofit their property at that critical trigger point for retrofitting, which is when you purchase a property. And we sent a letter to the Chancellor of the Exchequer with seven of the major UK financial institutions backing it. So that's that's one sort of area of policy and regulation and fiscal stimuli that could, could support. Another piece we're seeing that's really helping to drive the, the mortgage and the, the retail banking sector is a recent consultation uh, led by the government on the role of mortgage lenders in helping to improve home energy efficiency, which explored how the introduction of disclosures on the funding provided to improve properties and then potentially voluntary or mandatory targets on lenders on providing certain amounts of financing or improving properties within their portfolio by a certain number of SAT points are being considered. Now, again, this would provide a real incentive for financial institutions to focus on that improvement piece. So to Ed's point around here, financing the transition, not just funding already green assets. Um, but it would also, I think, would start to drive a greater dialogue between the financial sector, supply chains and homeowners. So those are sort of you know, a specific finance one, the slightly larger behavioural nudge uh, piece as well, that I'm sure uh, others on the panellists, other panellists will have uh, further ideas and recommendations uh, to your question. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Lucy, I don't know, I, I literally don't know whether you, you can comment on this, but, you know, presumably you, you've done some work around kind of data in, in building software, things like that. Um, are there any insights which which you could share? Um, maybe just reflecting on um, Emma's final comments there about behavioural uh, nudging and, and so on. I think um, uh, was in a very interesting meeting with Al Gore recently, who um, uh, has, has taken an investment in Octopus Energy through his generation fund. Now he talks about, uh, I think, I think uh, the economist's name is Rudy Dornbush, who talks about this idea that um, change takes longer to, to, to arrive than you think, but when it does arrive, it happens faster than you think. Um, and the reason I mention this is I think for uh, all of this huge topic of decarbonizing heat and buildings, and then more broadly society beyond that, um, actually, we're going to need to go through a huge transition. And I think um, really one of the areas that um, data can be very interesting here is to understand uh, how we can move from one state of the system through a kind of tipping point into uh, a, another fundamentally different state of the system. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that's very important there, I think, is actually understanding the difference between uh, individual people and households and their means and their motivations and how they arrive at decisions and what are the trigger points for them making specific decisions and those sorts of things. Um, that's the uh, some of some of the many things we are looking at at Centre for Net Zero and, and we're attempting to model. Um, this is if, if we think about things like electric vehicles and um, heat pumps and those sorts of things. What causes people to uh, adopt, to change from uh, their existing technology to adopt a new one? Um, for something like an electric vehicle, there are, very, um, there are very kind of clear trigger points at which somebody might change their car or purchase a, a car, for instance. Um, for, for something like a boiler, actually, typically that's a distressed purchase. People won't replace that until their existing boiler is broken. There are some exceptions to that. So maybe if somebody receives an inheritance or comes into some... Uh, uh, an unexpected windfall, they might take that type of decision. But I think um, understanding these different um, means, motivations, decision points um, is, is actually uh, a really important uh, part of this, uh, this whole debate um, and is some, somewhere where um, data can be, can be really valuable. Mm, thanks for that, Lucy. Um, Edward, I'm going to turn to you with this question, which is maybe kind of a more general one um, that we've kind of thrown flowed through our whole discussion today, but sort of hints at the, the idea that there's 
some would say kind of a market failure in taking action on um, decarbonizing homes and that you know a lot of the, the costs are kind of front loaded and, and you kind of pay them back very slowly but slowly but surely um, and in terms of kind of an investor perspective um, you know beyond sort of maybe the government it's obviously providing upfront grants and things like that is there anything else which you think it could be doing in terms of kind of solid policy levers that it could pull on to um, allow you know organizations like yourselves to um, help tra- um, fund that transition maybe a bit more smoothly yeah i mean it all comes back to this point about brown to green so it's all very well channeling um, private finance into green solutions and that's absolutely a positive thing to do but unless we really carefully define um, what brown to green really means and include that in the UK taxonomy uh, and hence reward investors for taking sustainable choices, then I think we will be stuck with this notion of green being green rather than green being working towards green. Mm. And you know, it's, this is especially true in our sector. So in non-domestic real estate uh, and commercial property, so industrial or retail or offices, Um, We have what's known, it was originally coined by Al Gore, actually, as as the agency issue, right? So the person that actually owns the building is probably a pension fund uh, in most cases. And the person that operates the building is is a company, uh, you know, could be a private or or a listed company that that doesn't necessarily have that agency to be able to make all of the decisions entirely by themselves about how the building is managed. And, you know, this often leads to short termism because each actor is trying to do the best they can within the confines of a financial year. And this isn't an evil capitalist conspiracy. It's simply just that the system works in in this way. Um, It's not necessarily practical for companies to raise the funds to own the building that they might wish wish to occupy uh, and consequently consequently have leasing. So what we need is is the mechanisms that actually tie those two parties together and enforce them, encourage them to work together, to start to be rewarded by um, government and seen as as being sustainable investments, which is, is really important. So a couple of examples I mentioned before about our net zero pathway. We committed to delivering a billion in sustainable transition loans. And this means that you... You know, commercial mortgage. Uh, we, as a lender of either investors, will lend a commercial mortgage. It could be 100, 150 million to a company. And we will encourage them to take on th- two or three different sustainability um, challenges in terms of decarbonizing um, their building through perhaps in, in installing rooftop solar or getting green certification or reducing their energy use. And we, working with our client, will reward them for it. So the cost of their debt is cheaper. And what this is, is it's everybody working together. So it's the beneficiaries ultimately um, making a very small sacrifice now for a long-term gain. It's the pension fund saying, well, actually, we kind of like companies that want to invest in their own processes because they're lower credit risk over the long term. And it's the company coming forward and saying, yes, I'll invest for the future and I'll take a lower cost of capital uh, in, in reward for doing that. So that's one example. I mean, even more specifically, just in property, our smart buildings program, we work with our occupiers to help them to decarbonize. And through the lockdown, we help to avoid over a million in energy utility costs, which is obviously through the lockdown, the time when people needed those cost savings the most. Now, all of these uh, projects that I'm talking about are all transition projects. They're not green projects. We're not just taking capital and investing it in green. But at the moment, you would be hard pressed to be able to pin those sorts of mechanisms, whether they're leases or power purchase agreements for solar or whether they are um, sustainable transition loans and actually class those as green. So that's the big change that's needed. Thanks, Matt. Um, we're, we're, we're running it out on time, but I think we've got just enough for maybe a couple um, more questions and one which um, I wonder if Lord Deven would like to take a crack at from Ken. Um, and actually, um, I was before we invited all our speakers today, we, we sort of asked them, you know, what are, what are the other benefits aside from climate that we might get from the transition towards a net zero um, building stock? And, and Ken's question is basically around that. So he's asked, you know, if we don't achieve net zero by 2050, um, does Lord Deven think um, what will happen in the UK? Will the investment be worth it? Well, it's not worthless at all. I mean, but we've got to make it happen by 2050. I mean, there's no point in, in mincing our words. If we don't do this, 
in Britain and in the rest of the world, then we really do face catastrophe because the uh, effects of temperatures rising more than two degrees, indeed more than 1.5 degrees, are really very, very serious indeed. And uh, people who don't think about it, just remember the whole of the population of Bangladesh lives bene beneath um, the, the high water mark. Now, if that's the case, uh, if you really think a world is going to be a world that's going to be easy to live in with huge numbers of people actually being unable to live where they live now, um, it's just one of the examples of what climate change really means. And the nearer you get to the equator, the worse that is, and the poorer you are, the more likely you are to suffer from climate change. So the, the fact is we've got to do it. Then, So I'm not prepared even to consider a possibility of not doing it. But the fact is that in doing it, we do, of course, make a better, cleaner, greener, kinder world. Exactly what I constantly say, but it's true. We will have less pollution. We will live in a place where the water is cleaner. We'll actually be able to live in circumstances where it is easier for communities to be built and to live together properly. These are the changes that really will take place on the way to 2050. So we fight climate change because it is catastrophic if we don't win, but in doing that, we improve the world we live in. Thank you. I don't know if any of the other panelists just kind of want to jump in on the back of that. Any other sort of, the key sort of objectives and benefits they think we can ascertain from a move to a cleaner um, housing stock and or building stock more generally? I'll just echo Lord Deben's points, to be honest. <laughs> I think it's a uh, wise work in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, okay, so maybe maybe we, we actually do have the time for a couple more um, short ones, and maybe kind of just remaining with you briefly, Lord Deben. Um, a, a question from Mary, um, very short and simple, actually. Um, how much did your heat pump cost? How has it affected your heating bills? Does it use green electricity? And how feasible is it to fit one into a small city flat? I actually think I remember... I think it was the launch of the sixth carbon budget. It was the day that you were getting yours installed. So, so um, I don't know if you want to pick up on, on that sort of collection of questions from Mary. Well, the truth is that uh, it, we certainly use green electricity. We, we, we work with bulb and, and uh, we uh, therefore have that. And we've just had the uh, half hour meter put in so that that's all ready to, to move that on. Um, I can't tell you exactly what the heat pump bit costs because we've had the, the whole of the system turned over. It's not, it is a house which, because it's um, a listed building, you can't do a lot of the things that you can do in other homes. So what we've tried to do is to put um, uh, as much um, insulation as we can in the circumstances. And now we're going to watch it very carefully and see how, how the, the, the effects of having all this will, will work. But the point I want to say is that I'm very fortunate because I can afford to do this. And what we've got to recognise is that it's very much more difficult for many people. And as Mary says, in a uh, inner city uh, flat, the opportunities are much less in the heat pump way. But there are things that can be done about blocks of flats. There is going to be much more opportunity for district heating, which now is extraordinarily good. It's not like the old system when you, when you only had the heat when other people were prepared to let you have it. Now you can really use it exactly as if it were your own heating system. But of course it can be green. So there are lots of opportunities to do that. And we could all do as much as we can do. So we could all change our supplier to somebody who is entirely green. And there are several of them, Octopus and, and Bulba, two of them. But I mean, you, there are several of them. You change to them. And, and you do so because they're not only providing green solutions directly to you, but they're also working to extend the opportunities that come from renewable energy. So I, I think we can make a lot of decisions. We mustn't say, because we can't do everything, we should do nothing. We must do as much as we can. And sometimes it's a good idea to wear a jumper. <laughs> Absolutely, I've got women on this morning. Um, <laughs> and maybe just kind of re remaining with the heat pump question um, very briefly, we've had another one in sort of about the, the question of um, skills in terms of um, doing all these retrofits. I don't know if 
um, Lord Ebenor or indeed any of the other panelists um, want to sort of ch ch chime in on this, that um, it seems that we, we need uh, a lot more people with the requisite skills to, to do the installations, to do the retrofitting. I don't know if anybody's got any ideas for potential policies that, that could help um, the government in terms of achieving that. Well, all I'd say is that it's crucial. If we're not careful, we're going to have a lot of green jobs and nobody to do them because our skill shortage is enormous. And uh, the government's skills bill, which is in front of Parliament at the moment, is absolutely crucial. I'd like it to go further, but it is in at least a very important beginning. We've always got it wrong. I once read um, a, a report of uh, how much um, less well we were doing it than Germany, only actually it wasn't Germany, it was Prussia. It was a report in the House of comments in the, in the 1860s we still hadn't got it right since then so we've actually got to work very hard on skills but also uh, we um oh sorry i was just going to come in no, 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 right ahead. there is there is also a role for finance to play in helping fund uh manufacturers installation companies you know boiler installers to be able to retrain and pivot. I think that that long-term policy is vital to give certainty of demand for organizations to move forward. But uh, we recently published a report with uh, Bankers for Net Zero and the APPG for Fair Era Business Banking, which outlines a number of different financial solutions that could help fund the transition um, and also a number of different policy areas as well. So again, recommend, um, recommend the audience go and have a look at that. But I think that certainty of demand is going to be vital. Otherwise, as Lord Deven says, um, we'll have loads of jo open jobs, but nobody with the right skills. And the last bit I'll just say is we've got a youth movement who are really enthusiastic about green. So why do we not give them vocational training from a young age exactly. to move into the green industries? Mm, absolutely. I'll certainly keep an eye out for that report you mentioned. Um, well, I'm afraid that our hour is almost up, um, so I think I should bring things to a close before we get cut off. Um, I've had a great time chairing today, really enjoyed the contributions from the panel and indeed questions from the audience. Um, I'd just like to say a, a huge thank you to Aviva for partnering with us, not just on this event, but the whole um, Getting to Net Zero series. Um, as I mentioned, this is the fourth event we're doing and, and we will have a final one on sort of the role of the financial services sector. Um, in helping deliver the net zero economy that will be coming up um, in the next uh, few weeks um, and keep it so keep your eyes peeled for that date um, the best place to do that is on the cps website or via twitter you can look for our social media at um, at cps think tank you can follow me at at Ava knives um, and all that remains for me to say is another huge thank you to my panelists and to all of you for watching this morning thank you thank you thank you very